Hey guys, welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. Remember in these videos, we take about eight different firearms that have come into our store and do about a two to four minute review on each one to give you guys an idea of some different stuff that is out there on the market. Keep in mind, the point of this video is strictly to be educational and informative. Uh, we are not making this video to market or sell anything, but just to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. Anyway, guys, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, jumping into this, remember the format of these videos is we start off with the most common and move through the least common as the video progresses. So starting off with our number one spot is the venerable High Point C9 handgun. This is a straight blowback design, nine millimeter single stack handgun. It does feature a polymer frame and zinc alloy slide. Now the internals are reinforced with steel where they need to be, like the barrel, the breech face, reinforced uh, guide rails, things like that. Now the biggest complaint about the high point handguns would be the weight. The C9 here has an unloaded weight of about 25 ounces, which is about double the weight of other uh, polymer frame handguns with a similar capacity. So you have such a big, blocky, heavy, and awkward feel in the handgun. Now, one thing about this is its robustness and durability. So there have been a lot of different tests that have been done on different YouTube channels online. You can go check them out where they've done uh, torture tests and meltdown drills and things like that. And these actually surprisingly hold up pretty well. So you might look at it and think, okay, it's a big blocky design. It's heavy, it's ugly, it's got a weird balance to it, and it's very limited in capacity. What is, why, why do people buy these? Well, the number one thing is the price point. So brand new, these things retail under $200 and about typically the $150 to $160 price point. Uh, used, you typically find them between $75 and $125 respectively. Well, this one has its box and, and uh, two magazines. Now, even the price on these is just a little bit elevated right now. Not a huge amount, but you know, up about $20, $30 uh, ahead of the, the, the current or the current market is ahead what their typical price point is by about the $20, $30 mark. Now, one of the biggest successes and one of the biggest sellers of the high points, especially in my store, are the carbines. Uh, of course, they make the 9s, the 40s, the 45s, and uh, those are actually really uh, regarded as actually really good for the money. The carbines you can get into new for about the $250 to $300 mark. Uh, used maybe knock off 50 to 100 bucks, and actually for that price point, those carbines are a lot of fun and actually very versatile. Um, People like to knock on the high point again for its looks, its aesthetics, its weight, and its price. Uh, you know, routinely people call it, you know, a boat anchor. It's an inexpensive, you know, you're better off throwing it at the at the attacker than shooting them with it. Uh, keep in mind the whole philosophy behind the high point firearms was to have something that everybody could purchase at any price point. So there are people who are strictly on a budget of $100 for a handgun. That's better than having nothing. And that was the whole mission statement behind high point firearms. And that's the whole sort of intended purpose of something like the C9. So keep in mind there are always places for things like this in the market and if you are on a very limited budget, again, not pretty to look at, but they are durable. They do generally work <laughs> and they are better than some of the other Saturday night special type things like the Larsons and the Phoenixes and stuff like that. So anyway, that's our number one spot. Okay, up next is another favorite of mine. This is the Ruger SR22. This one's actually in, in a unique sort of a black and gray woodland camo scheme with a stainless steel slide. So actually not a configuration I've ever seen or had in here before. So the SR-22 is a straight blowback 22 LR handgun featuring a 10 round magazine. This one comes with two, I believe they came with new, uh, two new in the box as well as a interchangeable uh, grip module and different floor plates that you can put on it to either give you a pinky extension or not. So these came out in 2012 and they were very closely related to the Walther P22. In some respects, people say that this is an improvement over the P22, so uh, both of them actually, in my opinion, are great guns, but I still do prefer the SR-22. There is something about its stylizing and its feel that I just prefer. Now, one great thing about the SR-22 that I have noticed is when it comes to semi-automatic 22 handguns, uh, especially in this variety, not the Target 22 uh, models, but the more of the uh, crossovers from the standard full-size guns, they tend to be very uh, picky and very finicky on ammo types. I've actually found that the SR-22, and I 
I have owned a couple over the years. Uh, the SR-22s that I have owned have actually not been very picky with ammunition. They've shot anything from uh, Winchester White Box to, of course, CCI Mini Mag Stingers and different things like that and they've generally done pretty well. Now, when it comes to 22s for training purposes, of course, you do have to anticipate that there is going to be an occasional jam. It's just the way the 22s are. I always recommend that they are good for training purposes, not necessarily uh, something like this good for home defense or concealed carry because of the propensity for the occasional jam or malfunction as opposed to something like a nine millimeter. Keep in mind you're re re relying on the force of that uh, of that recoil is what I'm trying to say, I'm sorry, to actuate the slide and cycle the action. So uh, just not a whole lot of power there with the 22, plus the components are tiny and they do tend to foul up pretty fast. So now I know a lot of people are gonna argue with me about that, but just something that I recommend. Uh, if you are going to carry 22, typically I recommend it in like a revolver uh, type of package, not really a semi-automatic. Now the target 22s, of course, you just usually have a moving bolt, not an entire slide. Those tend to be a little bit more reliable, but uh, anyway, I digress. The price point on these things brand new typically is about $320 to $350 used. You're probably about $50 to $100 under that. Now, of course, right now, prices are elevated. You know, we're seeing them used at about the three to 350 mark and new, uh, probably a little bit higher than that right now. Um, but hopefully those prices start to stabilize and come back down pretty soon. For the normal pricing of a used one, you know, $200, $250, these are excellent plankers. They make great ancillary training uh, implements and, and always a favorite for new first time shooters out on the range getting their uh, feet wet with uh, firearm ownership and marksmanship and that sort of thing. So I've always been uh, one of the first handguns I always recommend to first time buyers, especially if they are in the 22 market, is the SR-22 for those reasons. And seeing that it is a traditional handgun package, it does translate well over to your 380s, your 9s, your 45s. I mean, not in recoil, but just in general feel of the semi-automatic, the way it functions and all that. So anyway, um, happy to get these in. They never last too long and uh, always love to get these in the hands of new shooters. All right, up next I have two handguns I'm gonna show here together. These are both Smith & Wesson M&P 9 handguns. This is a first gen standard M&P and this is an M&P 2.0. Both of them, of course, we got in use and will be a good point of reference just to show them here together. Of course, I don't have a box here for the first gen M&P, but it would typically have come in the blue box with the uh, two magazines and then the interchangeable back straps. And then here on the 2.0, again, you have and now the black hard case, which comes with pretty much the same thing, same setup. Um, and actually it comes with three magazines instead of two. Here on the Smith & Wesson M&P line. Okay, so the line would launch uh, with the standard M&P handgun in 2005. So it's actually been quite a while. These have been out on the market for about 15 years. Uh, where they would compete heavily was against things like the Glock and things like the XD uh, that were uh, strong on the market at the time, obviously. The M&P was offered in uh, 22, and the 22 came about in, I believe, 2012. It was offered a 9mm 40, 357 SIG, and 45 ACP. And of course, those are all uh, chamber offerings today. In the M&P line, M&P stands for military and police. They did have a bunch of different configurations. They had the full-size version like this, the compact, they had the bodyguard, and of course they had the shield. So of course they came in the whole lineup from single stack to double stack, compact, to full size, and you have the whole variations there. On the first generation, it is a short recoil, uh, striker fired handgun. One of the biggest complaints about this was the trigger. They're not horrible and they definitely were an improvement over the SD or the Sigma line um, with just a little bit of grittiness, but of course something that is not really that far off from something like a Glock trigger or an XD trigger. It feels a little bit different, but they are very comparable. You have the stainless slide configuration. Uh, Smith & Wesson used what they call the Armo Knight finish. Now the retail price on the M&P line was generally about the $550 mark. Uh, when the uh, 2.0s would come out and I'll get to this in a minute. Uh, the prices on these would tend to drop back down. Uh, used, you can usually under normal circumstances pick one of these up for about uh, the $300 to $400 price point. Of course a 40 is going to bring in a little bit less. Love 40 or hate them. The pricing on 40s is just lower. Uh, typically something like this without the box under normal circumstances we would sell between $250 and $300. Okay a 9mm of 300 to 350 So about $50 to $100 higher uh, respectively. Now in 2014 the 2.0 series would launch. There was just a little bit of upgrades here. The big ones are a more aggressive sandpapery type feel, and that is 
definitely way more aggressive. As many of you guys who watch the channel know, I am not big on aggressive grip texturing, and this has always, to me, been aggressive. That's why I've always liked the first gen shield over the 2.0 shield is because of that. And a lot of people who carry, who don't have like an undershirt tucked between the gun and their, their stomach or whatever, their side, I uh, tend to complain of this sort of rubbing on them all day and, and kind of giving them grip burn or whatever you want to call it, uh, which is kind of uncomfortable. So other features included a improvement in the trigger with an over travel stop uh, here in the back of the frame trigger is noticeably different it's not night and day it's not like you're dropping an apex match trigger in there but it is definitely less uh, gritty is typically how people describe the mmp triggers a little bit more smooth and crisp with a quicker reset so definitely an improvement there they added front side serration so if you wanted to do press checking grab up here from the front you could do that um, other than that, those were generally the main changes that they made to the handgun. Now, of course, when the 2.0 would come out, they would take over the original MSRP of about, well, the MSRP at about six, but they typically sold between five and 550. And of course, because of that, the pricing on these would drop. Of course, we've already been over that. This one here has a thumb safety. This one here does not. You could get them in either option. Now, when the 2.0s launched, at least in my store, they never really did that well. I uh, always had better luck selling the standard first generation MMP, especially when they came in used. Um, I don't know what it is that people didn't really catch on to. Uh, maybe it just wasn't big enough of a change, or maybe it was the aggressive uh, grip texturing. I don't know what it was, but they just did not seem to catch on with the sales too much. And I always had a, a tough time selling these things brand new. So I never, I kind of quit buying them from my wholesalers and only sold them when they came in used like this one. So. Um, on the 2.0, again, retail now, new is about the 5550, of course, pricing is elevated. These things are going as high as 6, 650 right now. Uh, used, you're typically seeing them under normal conditions between at about 399, you know, $400 right now, 455 is pretty typical. So, um, you know, cool to get in. Uh, always like having MMPs and uh, nice to just have a sort of a match set here to show you guys the changes and the general generational differences between the two. So there you go. All right, up next is one that I am actually a fan of as well. I know I say that a lot about these. I'm, I'm a gun guy, what can I say? Uh, this is the FN FNS 9C. C standing for compact. They made the standard variation FNS as well, which would be the full size, and those would come onto the market in 2012. So they've been on the market for about eight years. Now, the cool thing about this is brand new in the box. This one does not have its box. It would come with three magazines, two 12 rounders and a 17 rounder. The two 12 rounders would have different floor plates. So you would have a pinky extension on this one, a, a flat base plate on this one, and then the extended mag with the grip sleeve on this. This is actually a standard capacity, uh, full size FNS magazine with the grip sleeve on it. This gives you 17 rounds and again these give you 12. So if you want that home defense sort of grip and feel on that range gun, you have that option. If you want a sleek carry option to take with you, you have that option. And if you want something in between, you have that option as well. So that's something I always thought was pretty cool. If you're going to add three mags in with the gun, especially in the compact variety, nice to have a little bit of uh, variation there to kind of give a little bit of a different usage for the pistol for different applications. I just always thought was pretty cool. Now this does have a trigger safety. The trigger on this is actually very nice. I always like these out of the box. Not a whole lot of creep or take up. Nice clean break, nice clean reset. Show you guys that. So just a very nice overall uh, package there. Now, brand new, these things run about $500. Used, they're running about 350 to four right now with prices being a little elevated. Typically about three to 350 is where I would sell these things at used before. They're up about $50, so not huge. Now these things were re uh, replaced a couple years ago by the 509 in the FN lineup. The FNS was the striker fired version of the FNX, which of course had a hammer fire uh, double single action. At any rate, these are really nice handguns. If you guys ever get the chance to take a look at one in your dealer's gun store, uh, definitely worth picking up and taking a look at. Uh, like I said, I actually prefer these over uh, the 509. Just very low bore axis, nice grip, nice width and weight to it. Just overall nice handgun. Again, if you could pick one of these up for three to four hundred dollars, definitely worth it and uh, definitely consider uh, picking one up. Okay, up next I have an interesting one from Beretta. This is the Beretta U22 Neos handgun. 
Now this one here features a four and a half inch barrel. They also made them in a six and a seven and a half. And the interesting thing is, is the barrels could interchange. Each one had its own Picatinny rail up here at the top. Now this is a semi-automatic 10 round capacity 22 LR target pistol with a moving bolt similar to what you would find on the Browning Buckmark, the, uh, let's see, the, the uh, Ruger Mark series, the Smith & Wesson uh, 22A series. So this would basically fit in with those lines. So the uh, Beretta U22 Neos would come onto the market in 2002. And then in 2004, they would come out with a DLX or deluxe version. And then that would discontinue in, I think about 2007. And then also in 2004, they came out with a carbine kit version so you could convert this into a carbine. So uh, they are still making the general uh, U22 uh, Neos today, but of course, deluxe version has been discontinued. Now, brand new, these have actually been kind of difficult to find, brand new. They do retail under normal circumstances for about $300, which puts it right in line with the Ruger Standard Model Mark IV series. And again, the butt marks and, and everything else in that sort of uh this sort of genre. Uh, but lately, again, they've been hard to find new, and I've seen the used ones go for about, like the blued ones going for about the 3 to 320 mark, and the Inox versions, the stainless versions, uh, going upwards of about the $400 mark. Now, of course, they did make this in the blued configuration that you see here, and the Inox with the stainless barrel and everything. The frame is of polymer construction, the slide, the barrel assembly is metal. Anyway, this is the first Neos I've actually ever had in here. It is a very interesting and very iconic look and design. Uh, uh, you definitely, this is something you would look at and say, yeah, right away, that's a Beretta. Uh, Beretta tends to go with the interesting sort of like alien-esque type design features. You find those on like the uh, PX4 Storm handgun lineup, uh, the CX4 Storm, the carbine version. They just sort of have these weird, long, swooping, uh, sleek type of designs that sort of break the mold on traditional handgun and uh, carbine appearance. That's typically how you know you can look at one. So they definitely uh, set, uh, set themselves apart from other things like it in the market, and you'll definitely know what you're looking at when you see it. If you do see a Neos, uh, definitely worth taking a look. Now, in 2010, there was a recall. It was a safety recall because these were known to fire potentially with the safety engaged. So because of that recall, of course, the reputation of the Neos did suffer a little bit. Maybe that's why they're a little bit tough to find. I honestly have not kept up with the market in this genre of firearms in the 22 competition line. Uh, just kind of go off of some information, things that I've sort of heard from the grapevine. Anyway, interesting design. I personally have never fired one. I'm sure it would be a fun shooting experience. Um, also, the modularity getting into the different barrel configurations and potentially the carbine configuration is a nice option there also to give this a little bit more versatility in the field and on the range. Uh, so just an interesting option might uh, kind of fit your needs and might be worth taking a look at if you see one. All right, up next I have a Ruger Gunsight Scout. Now this would have come out onto the market in 2011 and would have been a uh, sort of revamped and re-released version of the popular Ruger Model 77. This is a bolt action rifle which uses a detachable box magazine. You could get these in 10, five, and three round configurations. And they chambered these for 308, 223, and 450 Bushmaster. Now the MSRP on these things brand new uh, is about 1,050. Uh, you could typically find them around the $900 mark. You used, you were typically about six, seven, eight hundred dollars uh, in there, depending on accessories, condition, if it came with a box, that sort of thing. Of course, right now the market is up a little bit on these. Uh, used are going about in the eight hundred dollar range. New, I believe they're going up around twelve if you can find them. Now this does feature a laminated wood stock. Really, really nice, sort of grayish, brownish uh, coloration here a stainless bolt. Receiver here is blued. You could get the uh, stainless uh, barreled action version of this. It has a Picatinny rail up here at the front. Of course, detachable magazines. This is a metal magazine, but the AIS or AICS magazines, of course, are compatible with this rifle. Overall, a really nice handy configuration. The sights are going to be reminiscent of what you're going to find on the Mini 14 or a lot of other Ruger, Ruger rifle uh, components and configurations. With this nice um, heavy butt plate here on the back actually being a small lightweight package with that butt plate, it does a really good job of dampening and mitigating recoil. If you're looking for a hunting, a brush rifle, something that's compact and easy to move around, nice birdcage flash try to right up here at the front, something with optics, scout style, of course, capability. Being up here gives you longer eye relief and also clears the action. I know that there are mounts where you can remove the rear sight and mount 
Um, there's provisions for uh, scope rings right here, the little notches. Again, what you would find on like a Mini 14, for example, uh, you can run that way as well. So lots of different variations and options here, of course, with those magazine compatibility, uh, the three, the five, and the 10 round. Of course, if you have hunting restrictions, you can use those as well. So really nice uh, thought out package by Ruger uh, for like the modern hunting or just target shooting enthusiast crowd. Really lightweight, really nice looking, really rugged, light on recoil. Overall, a nice package. I don't get these in here very often. This is probably the second used one I've had. People tend to hold on to these. So uh, if you do see one, definitely take the opportunity to take a look. Uh, might make a next uh, really good hunting rifle for you. Okay, up next I have a couple Krag Jorgensen carbines. So these were, the Krag rifle was designed by Krag and Jorgensen who were two Norwegian arms designers. Now the Americans would adopt the Krag Jorgensen as their standard issue uh, military firearm in 1892. And of course there was a lot of uh, local American arms designers who were very upset about a you know foreign design coming in and taking over uh, the winning the contract in 1892 as the standard issue rifle. Of course, these are in carbine configuration. The rifle configurations would have been about eh, several, maybe about out to here on the barrel with a full length stock. Now, the model 1892, of course, it was adopted in that configuration. In 1896, there were a couple revamped changes. The direction of the magazine cut off here, which actually you could cut off uh, feeding from the internal magazine and load single rounds if you wanted to take individual shots without actually tapping into your ammunition reservoir. And the other change they made was by putting a two-piece cleaning rod into the stock. And then in 1986, they would make another revision to their firearm. And then again in uh, 19, I'm sorry, 1986, 1988, and then 1989. So that's kind of the years of the changing. And now the most prolific use of the Krag Jorgensen rifle was in this here in the United States was in the Spanish American War, where quickly we learned that there were sh some shortcomings in the Krag design as opposed to the Mauser action, which is what the Spanish were using was the Spanish Mauser. So some of the things that made the Krag Jorgensen popular and some of the things that led to its adoption into US military service was this interesting side loading system. You took five rounds, you popped them into the side. You did not need to use a stripper clip, but you did not need to intricately load each one carefully on top of the other. You could virtually just toss them in, let them sit in there, and then when you close the door, it pushed everything into, into the feedway and, and you, know, you didn't have to sit there and manipulate the bullets going in, especially when you were under stressful circumstances. The other thing is it was easy to top off. You could leave a chambered round with the breech and the action closed, ready to fire at any time. Go ahead and open this up, pop in rounds to top off your magazine. If you get in trouble before you're finished, you can quickly pull the trigger and it'll fire and then you can close that and then continue feeding. So those are two big popular things. Now, the problems were is you could not use a stripper clip, which you could use on the Mauser action. So reloads on a Mauser actually were quicker. You could keep your five rounds on a clip. Uh, easier to just pull out all five rounds together, stick them in the top, close your bolt, keep firing. Whereas the crag, you got to pull out, you know, uh, your your from your bag, you know, several rounds of ammunition and pop them in, or you would have an ammo belt and you would have to pull them off your belt one at a time. So uh, those are some shortcomings. And again, the United States would move into uh, designs like the 1903 Springfield, which was really a copy off of the Mauser action. In fact, Germany sued America and then they had to pay royalties during World War One. But again, that gets into the 1903. Craig Jorgensen's uh, other topic here is this is a sporterized version of this. These are both 1986 carbines. As you can see, this one was sporterized. The art of sporterizing was very popular in, uh, you know, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, when surplus rifles like this were not very uh, expensive. They were not collectible. You didn't have arms collecting really it was not a huge thing back then. You would take inexpensive rifles like this, chambered in obscure calibers like the 3040 Krag, which is what this was chambered in. Usually they would rechamber them. I don't believe that this one has been, just something like 30 6 You put it in a sporting configuration stock, put on a nice uh, rear sight, and you've got a relatively inexpensive hunting rifle. Because sporterizing was done typically by the at-home gunsmith or what a lot of people in the collector's community call Bubba. Uh, the rifle has been bubba you know, in his garage with his hacksaw. Usually all sporters are in con different configurations, different stocks, different finishes, different sights. So they're usually kind of like a, a, a one-off in each uh, configuration. Now the problem is, is sporterizing of course definitely hurts the value because you've taken away a lot of what makes the gun collectible. Like this, of course, is what this looked like before it was sporterized. So completely different stock, 
uh, removal of the handguard, uh, the rear sight has been removed, the um, and been replaced with with I don't know even it's probably alignment or something like that uh, because this has been put in place the uh, disconnect here has been removed from this. So a lot of its original components have just been taken off and thrown away and the whole thing's been refinished. So this is probably about half or less of the value as this. Getting into the value, a typical standard rifle length crag is going anywhere from about $700 to $900 right now in good condition. The carbines do bring in more money because they were not as common, typically ranging anywhere from $800 to $1,500 depending on condition and also if it was um, a 80, uh, 86 and 88 and 89 carbine, you know depending on its configuration. If it's an early one, uh, they did have experimental carbines where the uh, stock went out a little bit further. So, you know, there are different variations that bring in different, different amounts of money, but um, there is not a massive collecting market. I mean, there are collectors for U.S military firearms like this, but the collector market is not as big in this era or like trap doors as it is in World War One and World War II firearms like 1903s, uh, 1917s, M1 Garands, Enfield, stuff like that. So, you know, they are definitely going up in value. They are uh, different, very interesting period in arms design with a loading system. So it is a very unique system and you can very quickly spot it out on a rifle rack. If you do see one worth taking a look at, the action's nice and smooth. It's just a cool overall nostalgic uh, piece of US uh, military history and uh, really cool to get a set of crag carbines in here like this. All right, up next I have a model 1917 rifle, caliber 30, which was predominantly used by American forces during World War I. Now the story of this rifle begins actually back in the Boer War when the British were fighting up against 7 by 57 millimeter Mauser, which was a super, uh, was a, a small caliber high velocity round, which could outrange and outperform the British standard 303 cartridge at the time. The British War Department would begin production on a new experimental round called the 276 Enfield, which was going to be, of course, able to match a 7x57, a higher velocity, uh, higher range round, which actually later would be used in you know, sniping rolls and things like that. So Vickers was, of course, taken up with the task of creating the new, new rifle that would be chambered in that with a stronger action, a Mauser type action, which would be basically be in this configuration called the P13 or Pattern 13. Uh, they would then, it, it kind of went by the wayside and they continued production with the standard number one Mark III and Mark III Star Enfields, which would basically stay as predominant British service through World War I, World War II and beyond. Now when World War I would kick off, uh, Great Britain would need more, uh, you know, they were lacking in resources and material and equipment, so they would actually solicit the help of uh, Remington, Winchester, and Eddystone, which is a division of, of Remington back in the United States, to take a production of what would be known now as the P-14, which was just like the P-13, but now chambered in the standard issue British 303, and would be used as an ancillary issued rifle for the British troops in World War I. Shortly after that, the United States get pulled, gets pulled into World War I, and we need a rifle. Now, we have the 1903 Springfield that was in production, of course, from 1903 until 1917, but of course it was not really in wartime production. Now, of course, they did exist in the arsenals and they could be brought into service, but of course not at the levels that the United States needed them to be available for. So the United States had the option, you know, Winchester, Remington, and Eddystone were already producing these and had, uh, you know, parts configurations and machinery set up for this rifle. So the decision became, do we, have everybody retool for 1903 production or do we just have them continue making the pattern 14 rifle just in the 30-06 caliber that the existing 1903s were already chambered in they went with the decision to come out with this rifle in 30-06 which became known as the u.s model 1917 caliber 30 uh, or the model of 1917. Now, of course, production would continue with Winchester, Remington, and Eddystone. This actually has a conglomeration of all three parts. The W, of course, being Winchester, parts marked R, of course, being Remington, and parts marked E, of course, being Eddystone. The reason they would mark these parts is back in P14 production, there was actually standardization problems, so they did this because typically Winchester, Remington, and Eddystone parts typically only worked well with each other without needing modification. Lots of people attribute the 1903 as being the standard issue military rifle to U.S. troops during the war. In fact, the 1917 actually saw more service, more of these were produced and issued to U.S. troops during the war. So it's just a fun fact there. So a really cool rifle. Now, when you get down to the price point on these, uh, they 
they're kind of all over the place. The Winchesters, if you get an all matching, not really matching, but if you get an all correct Winchester in original condition, they can be like $1,500 to $2,000, uh, followed by Remington in terms of value, followed by Eddystone. Um, of course, if it's a mismatched parts gun, I wouldn't really call it a parts gun, but if it's got, you know, non-correct parts, uh, somewhere around seven, eight hundred dollars as a shooter. If it's been sporterized, you're probably at three to five hundred dollars. Uh, so something like this, just a standard shooter grade, but in original military configuration, no import marks or anything like that. Um, typically, you know, again, anywhere from seven to nine hundred. Um, an original all-correct gun might be 1500 plus. I'll give you an idea. I don't see too many of these things. Um, they are very heavy, much heavier, bigger, ro more robust than the 1903. Um, and I imagine, you know, just a very light shooter. It cocks on closed, just like the standard issue infield. So, you know, you could definitely see design features taken from the British pattern of rifles like the number one Mark III. So anyway, a very cool rifle to come in. Don't see too many of them, and I'm sure it won't last long. If you get a chance, if you're into US or British military, yeah, just something cool to think about adding to the collection if you happen to see one. All right, well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. And also, if you want to see more videos like this, we do post them every week. So please go ahead and subscribe to the channel and hit that bell notification button so you are aware when these new videos come out. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. I will see you next time.